First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now the full test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as the recording is not played twice. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to five. Hello, I'm Steve. Welcome to Bruntwood Sports Centre. Can I help you? Hello, yes, I hope you can help me. I'd like some information about joining the Sports Centre. Do you have any idea about what kind of membership you'd like? We do full membership swimming only, or gym and classes, and there are special rates for students and different age groups. Yes, I checked online before I came here. I'd be interested in the full membership, and I wouldn't be eligible for any of the special rates. That's great. Can I take some details from you to start with? Of course. First of all, what's your name? It's Alice Watson. Is that Watson? W A T S O. N? That's right. Good. Now, can I take your address, please? It's 16 Austin Way, Bruntwood. Is that A-U-S-T-E-N for Austin? That's right. And was it 16 or 60? 16. Thanks. Do you know the postcode? Oh, yes. It's BR58HY. Thank you. Now, I need your date of birth, please. I was born on the 13th July, 1996. Are you sure you can't get a student membership? I'm afraid not. I'm not a student. I have a full-time job. What's your job? I'm a dental assistant. Now, can I take a contact telephone number for you? Of course. My home number is 01763 973 Six double four. Do you have a mobile number as well, as that's often easier to reach people on? Oh yes, it's O seven 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 two O two one three double eight. Do you call people often? It's not for marketing, if that's what you're worried about. It's just if a class you've signed up with has changed for any reason, we can let you know and save you a wasted journey. Oh, I see. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. Can I ask you some things about the facilities, please? Of course. I was interested in doing some classes. What ones do you run? Well, as you've a full-time job, the ones that would be suitable for you would be the early ones, which are for one hour and start at either 6 or 7 a.m. We have wake-up aerobics, spinning and fat burn at both those start times. And later in the day, I finish work at 4.30 in the afternoon. There are aerobics, keep fit and spinning classes hourly from 4pm and there are also Pilates classes and yoga classes and they're hourly from 6pm. At the weekends, all these classes are done regularly all through the day. The schedule changes from time to time, so I'll give you our latest schedule before you leave. The schedules are also on our website and they're always up to date. Can I swim early too? Oh yes. The pool is open from 6am and, as the first three hours are mostly used by people who are swimming for exercise, two-thirds of the pool is divided up into lanes for exercise swimming. There are two lanes for slow swimming, two for medium and two for fast. And what time does the pool close? 
Well, the centre closes every day at 10.30pm and so the pool closes half an hour before that. You can swim up until then every day. Now, I'd like to ask about the gym. I've never done that and I'd like to give it a go to see if it'll suit me. Well, I'd recommend it. It can really develop people's core strength and by doing that you'll avoid injuries at other sports. It also really makes you feel good about yourself. So our gym is open during the opening hours of the centre and if you want to try it out, you'll need to book an induction with one of the instructors so that you get to know the machines. This will help prevent you from injuring yourself. Inductions are free for full members. Another thing you can do is book a regular session with a personal trainer. This is a great way of getting fit. Not only is it harder to be lazy and avoid going for your session, but the trainers are great motivators. Those are great ideas. Thanks. I'll definitely try that. That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a woman giving some information about facilities at a holiday resort. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the information talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this information talk. Most of you arrived here at the Sun and Sand Resort yesterday evening, and it's my job today to let you know a little bit about what's available for you here and where these things are. We are currently in the main reception area. If you leave here, you'll find the ornamental lake right in front of you. Directly opposite, you'll find the bus stop, which I'll tell you more about later. If you take the path from the right-hand side of the lake, you'll pass the mini-golf on your left and, just after that, the swimming pool on the right. If you continue down the path, you'll reach the sports center, where you can use the resort's gym and squash courts and also take part in the regular exercise classes that we run there. If you take the left-hand path from the lake, this will take you to the resort's private beach. On the way down, you'll see our tennis courts on the right-hand side. When you arrive at our beach, you'll see our snack bar on the right-hand side just behind the beach. Food and drink is available here. Back across the path from the snack bar is the activities office, which is also behind the beach. If you're not the type of person who just likes lying on the beach all day, you can visit this office and they'll give you details about the kayaks, sailing boats, pedalos, and various other beach equipment that we have. Finally, our beach is enclosed on both sides and the area to the far left as you arrive by the path is reserved for over 18s. People can find there a quiet place away from the noise of children if they so wish. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
now listen to the rest of the information talk and answer questions 16 to 20. So, now that I've told you a little about where things are, I'd like to give you some information about them all. I mentioned earlier the resort's bus stop. This is from where our dedicated minibuses leave to take residents into the nearby town. This is seven miles away, so taking this complimentary bus service is your best way of getting to the town. We also have a dedicated taxi at the hotel that you can use at any time if you wish, but this service must be paid for. Swimming at the resort's pool can be enjoyed only when there is a lifeguard on duty. This starts at 6.30 a.m. and finishes at 7.30 p.m. Swimming is all part of the Sun and Sand Resort's all-inclusive package. Exercise classes and use of the gym in the sports center are all complimentary, but lights for the squash courts have to be paid for. Coins have to be inserted into the meters so that you can have the light to play by. Booking a squash court itself is free. If you'd like to play tennis, book a court at reception. This is part of Sun and Sand Resort's all-inclusive package, as is use of all the recreational equipment at the beach, though a returnable $20 deposit is required for all equipment. Eating and drinking at the main buildings of the resort are also inclusive, but the beach snack bar is extra and things can be paid by cash or be put on the guests' bills. There is a deep-sea fishing activity that can be booked from reception. This is contracted out to a local fisherman and not part of the Sun and Sand Resorts package. The price list for the different fishing options available can be found at reception. Finally, we have entertainment at the main buildings of the hotel every evening. People can enjoy their inclusive food and drink dinners whilst enjoying the music, magic, dancing, or whatever is billed on the different evenings. We have quiz evenings weekly and sometimes comedy acts as well. We ask a dollar for each team member for the quiz pot so that we can make a prize for the winners who get the whole pot. That is the end of section two. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear two students and their teacher discussing a field trip that the students are going to conduct. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, Dr. Rogers. Can we speak to you for a moment? Oh, hello, Samantha. Hello, Eric. Yes, I'm free. What can I do for you? It was about our geography field trip. We wanted to explain to you a little about it so that we know that we're doing the right thing. OK, off you go. Well, to begin with, we decided our field trip will focus on the River Stour. The river is not far from where we both live, so that will help us when we need to do secondary visits to it. Yes, that will be useful. It's sometimes only later on, during a project, that people realise they need further data and a long journey can sometimes be very awkward to arrange. That's what we thought. Well, I'm glad you're taking those things into account. Now, you'll need to go right up to the source of the river to get the correct readings. Oh yes, we'll begin there. We'll be doing a road trip for a few days to collect all the information we need. 
What sorts of things will you be studying at the river? We'll be looking at how the River Stour is part of the area's different watersheds. What sort of data will you be collecting? We'll be taking water samples along the length of the river to start with. We'll also need data on flow levels, but of course we won't be able to get good figures on that in one trip. Samantha and I are going to visit the National River Authority's offices in Stourbridge. They have all the data there that we need. Have you got an appointment with them? Yes, one of the water officers will be meeting us and will give us admittance to the archives that we need. The people at the National River Authority were very helpful when I called them. Good. Now, you'll also need more data than what you've mentioned so far if you want to examine the area's watersheds. Yes, we know that. Watersheds themselves consist of all surface water and include lakes, streams, reservoirs and wetlands, as well as all groundwater and aquifers. We'll need to work on all these water systems in the area. We won't be able to include everything in our project, as the word limit is relatively short. Our plan is to include a bit of everything, but focus on the role of the River Stour in the area's watersheds. That all sounds fine. You now have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 26 to 30. I also wanted to ask about when we have to give in the project. Well, last year the students had to give it in on the 1st of October. A lot of students found that they didn't have enough time though, so I was thinking of making it exactly a month later. However, I'm not really sure yet. You've plenty of time right now, so just keep an eye on the department website and I'll post the due date when I'm sure. And what is the exact word limit? There's a 5,000 word limit, but don't forget you need to include appendices with any background detail that you need to provide. I will also require an annotated bibliography with all of the sources that you used. Now, these latter two things aren't included in your word limit, but you need to be aware that this is quite a lot of extra material that needs to be included in your projects. Is there any equipment that you could recommend we take, Dr. Rogers? Of course, there are lots of things that you'd find useful. You'll need a water chemistry test kit, turbidity tubes, TDS probes, nets, hip waders, compasses, stopwatches, and a field guide of that area. Although you can buy all these things online, you might as well sign them out from the department for nothing. There's a returnable deposit, but it's not too excessive. That's very handy advice, Dr Rogers. Thanks. What I must also remind you about is to take security precautions. I know that you are all quite responsible, but being around water can always have potential dangers and you must take particular care if there's been a lot of rain and the river is high. First of all, stay together. If one of you falls in or gets into difficulties, then the other immediately knows about it and can do something. The other major thing to take care about is washing your hands after being in contact with the water. River water is not as clean as it used to be, and if you come into contact with river water and then eat without washing your hands, you run the risk of ingesting bacteria. This can lead to all sorts of tummy upsets. That is the end of section 3. You will now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of a zoology lecture on the Tasmanian Devil. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello everyone and welcome to this zoology lecture. The Tasmanian devil cannot be mistaken for any other marsupial. Its spine-chilling screeches, black colour and reputed ferocity led the early European settlers to call it the devil. Although only the size of a small dog, it can sound and look incredibly fierce. Devils once occurred right across mainland Australia, with fossil remains having been found widely around the continent, but it is believed the devil became extinct on the mainland some 400 years ago. Devils probably became extinct there due to increasing aridity and the spread of the dingo, which was prevented by the Bass Strait from entering Tasmania. Today the devil is symbolic of Tasmania, but it hasn't always held this status. Tasmanian devils were considered a nuisance by early European settlers of Hobart Town who complained of raids on poultry yards. In 1830, the Van Diemen's Land Company introduced a bounty scheme to remove devils, as well as Tasmanian tigers and wild dogs from their northwest properties. For more than a century, devils were trapped and poisoned. They became very rare and seemingly headed for extinction but the population gradually increased after they were protected by law in June 1941. Tasmanian devils are found throughout Tasmania in all native habitats, as well as in forestry, plantations and pasture, from sea level to all but the highest peaks of Tasmania. Densities are lowest in the button grass plains of the southwest and highest in the dry and mixed forests and coastal heath of Tasmania's eastern and northwest coasts. Open forests and woodlands are preferred, while tall or dense wet forests are avoided. Most are found in mixed patches of grazing land and forest or woodland. Relative trapping success and spool and line tracking indicates that Tasmanian devils travel through lowlands, saddles and along creeks, avoiding steep slopes and rocky areas and favouring predictable places with rich sources of food such as carcasses, trash dumps and roads. Dens are typically underground burrows such as old wombat burrows, dense riparian vegetation, thick grass tussocks and caves. Adult devils are thought to remain faithful to their dens for life, so den disturbance is destabilising to populations. The devil is mainly a scavenger and feeds on whatever is available. Powerful jaws and teeth enable it to completely devour its prey, bones, fur and all. Wallabies and various small mammals and birds are also eaten, either as carrion or prey, and reptiles, amphibians, insects and even sea squirts have been found in the stomachs of wild devils. Devils maintain bush and farm hygiene by cleaning up carcasses, which can help reduce the risk of blowfly strike to sheep by removing food for maggots. Devils are famous for their rowdy communal feeding at carcasses, the noise and displays being used to bring about dominance within the pack. The devil is nocturnal and during the day it usually hides in a den or dense bush. It roams considerable distances, up to 16 kilometres, along well-defined trails in search of food. It usually ambles slowly with a characteristic gait, but can gallop quickly with both hind feet together. 
Young devils are more agile, however, and can climb trees. Although not territorial, devils can have a home range. The famous gape or yawn of the devil that looks so threatening can be misleading. This display is performed more from fear and uncertainty than from aggression. Devils also produce a strong odour when under stress, but when calm and relaxed, they are not smelly. The devil makes a variety of fierce noises, from harsh coughs and snarls to high-pitched screeches. A sharp sneeze is used as a challenge to other devils and frequently comes before a fight. The Tasmanian devil mates for the first time at the end of their second year. It breeds around March and it takes 31 days after mating for the young to be born. The female has about 20 to 30 live offspring, all of which are approximately a gram. Unfortunately, there is only room in the pouch for four devils and usually only two or three actually stay in the pouch. The other young devils are usually eaten by their mother. The young stay in the pouch for about 100 days. They stay with their mum outside of the pouch for about five to six months and then fend for themselves. The mean lifespan for a devil is approximately six years, although they live longer in captivity. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers.